I was silver. We know this guy. We know this guy from childhood or whenever. And today we have an episode called Finders Keepers, but I'm turning off the... I'm going to turn off the sound because that's really not why we're here today. It's Christmas time when I'm recording this. And, you know, there's a certain song that just comes up every single year at Christmas time. And it still does. And it came up in my childhood. And it was considered one of the most beautiful Christmas carols we ever did in the United Church of Canada. And it was called the Huron Carol. Um, it was in the moon of wintertime. It says here it was a Canadian Christmas hymn, Canada's oldest Christmas song, written probably in 1642 by Jean de Brébeuf, a Jesuit missionary at Saint-Marie among the Hurons in Canada. Now the legend is he wrote this to try to make Christianity palatable or understandable to quote-unquote Indians. It was considered okay because he loved the Indians. It was made clear in various places I looked. He loved the Indians. So it was not like, oh, he was making them convert or anything like that. I don't really know how they know that, that, they, that he loved the Indians, but that's part of the myth. Um, the, the, the song has been rewritten over the years to make the lyrics scan better and all this kind of thing. And I, I think to make it more understandable now to white people, um, for the longest time it was kind of a way to make spirituality of the Aboriginal people accessible to whites, so it kind of got flipped around. You know, I'm going to sing part of it, so look out. Twas in the moon of winter time when all the birds had fled that mighty Gitche Manitou sent angel choirs instead. Before the light the stars grew dim and wandering hunters heard the hymn. Jesus your King is born, Jesus is born in excelsis gloria. Now, it is kind of a little strange to me that um, the angel choirs uh, come instead of mighty Gitche Manitou, and I don't really see who Gitche Manitou is, it doesn't seem to matter to anybody, it's a generic Indian, I'm going to use the term with quotations, Indian God figure, and they use terms like in excelsis gloria, and I don't think the Hurons really knew what that meant. Oh, hi there, honey. Oh, my cat likes to get in on, on the deal. I'll read a bit more of it. Within a lodge of broken bark, the tender babe was found. A ragged robe of rabbit, rabbit skin enwrapped his beauty round. But as the hunter braves drew nigh, the angel song ran loud and high. Refrain. Um, the chiefs from far before him knelt with gifts of fox and beaver pelt. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a terrible song. My first, sorry about that. My first uh, draft, watch out cat. My first draft of this video, I was on a real rant with it. But um, I've got a few more thoughts now about it. And I think, sorry, why it bothers me so much, and I can't find the, Thing I was going to read. Oh my god. I'm going to look it up right now so you can just wait on me here. Uh, okay. I, you know, I don't want to stop this camera. I want to just. Song of Hiawatha. The Song of Hiawatha. Now this is what the Huron Carol reminds me of. It's a song written by white people to describe to white people what native people are like. 
Aboriginal people, as we'd say now, First Nations. Um, not unlike what I've just read, which is the most beloved hymn in the Canadian repertoire. I don't see the difference myself. By the shore of Gitchigumi, by the shining big sea water, at the doorway of his wigwam, in the pleasant summer morning, Hiawatha stood and waited. All the air was full of freshness, all the earth was bright and joyous. And before him, through the sunshine, westward toward the neighboring forest, past in golden swarms the Amo, past the bees, and blah, 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 blah. This goes on. I don't even see this. I mean, look at this. It's a whole story. Whoa! And it's about Hiawatha. <laughs> and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and I think a lot of people read it and thought, hmm, that's lovely. It was the idea of the noble savage, and that really is what they used, the term they used. Um, to try to nobilify who really they thought, people they thought were savages, or so outside their own culture, they couldn't understand them at all. But some people thought or did see nobility in, in the Indian. It's not a bad thing, but to write something like by the shores of Gitchigumi, you know, it's like, from the land of sky blue waters. You know, obviously we still do stuff like that. And Cleveland Indians, you know, cartoons for years had Indians Indians as not really fully human. You know, they were cartoon characters. It was way weird, but that was the standard. Um, now, one of the reasons I had the Lone Ranger on, and I had to turn it off, Tonto was the real star of that show as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> Jay Silverheels. I know I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to talk at the same time. Jay Silverheels was a very distinguished actor um, of the Mohawk Nation. And we're going to try to get a picture of him up here. They don't say anything about Tono here because it's a short version. Uh, Tono's in there and believe me, he was to me the hero because he was a better horseman, he was I think a better actor and he had a better character. Now he was Mohawk uh, and a Canadian boy. So there's a Canadian connection there. Amen. Finders keepers. Um, he had a distinguished career, but it was in westerns. Uh, what choice did he really have? He could not. White man can play anything. An Indian or an Aboriginal man has to play. An Aboriginal man doesn't have much choice and had to play not even a contemporary Aboriginal man, but someone from the Wild West. And what really used to gall me, and still does, is how many of these Indians were played by white men. They were extras, you know, and, and <laughs> Leonard Nimoy played Indians for a long, long time. Like, you know, he had brown eyes, I guess. Um, he was a good actor. Uh, he might have been a little hungry for the work at the time. And they were small parts. It wasn't until Dances with Wolves that we really saw a full cast of people who were First Nations and were speaking their own language. But we had this wonderful man from the Mohawk culture um, who's a marvelous actor. I have a little bit of a connection with Mohawk and I, sorry, I that happened to me. Um, long. My connection to the Mohawk goes back a long way. When I was about 10, my sister was about 23. She was in university and she used to get engaged and come home and announce her engagement and then that would be off and she'd come home and be engaged and another one would be off and she came home one day and opened the front door and closed it and came up to everybody and announced, I am engaged to a full-blooded Mohawk Indian. And she was. She was engaged to a man named Claire Brandt. 
No, uh, he was from Mohawk Six Nations in Ontario. And of the Brant, Chief Brant lineage in that very Brantford, Ontario, there's a connection there. So in other words, quite a distinguished First Nation family. And I met in university. He was studying to be a doctor. And that was kind of unusual then. It wasn't even allowed for a long time. An Indian couldn't be a doctor. What? There was a, you know, what are they talking about? But he did. I don't remember a lot about him, except he was Mohawk and, and um, soft-spoken person. I did keep thinking about Tonto. What was I, nine, ten? What frame of reference did I have? Oh, look, there's Brebouf. <laughs> And the Lone Ranger, he looks so campy to me. This guy is so campy. Um, there's Brebeuf. And he's going, he's a ragged robe of rabbit skin. That's what he's doing. There we got Tonto. I just wish the camera would linger on him a little bit longer. Because he was so handsome. Uh, we had this, my sister um, engaged to this Mohawk. It did not work out just as none of the others did. She went to Germany for years, and I don't, still don't really know why she went to Germany. We had no connection with Germany in our family. She wrote a thesis in German, went to Germany, got pregnant, and came back to her fiancé and said, guess what, I'm pregnant. So it broke up. Uh, so I did not end up having um, an Aboriginal brother-in-law. I don't know what would have happened. I don't, I don't know whether it would have lasted. Now, I, when I made my last, I <laughs> love this too, but, okay. when I made my last version of this video, I got very worked up about the Huron Carol, and I'm still, I have very mixed feelings about it. It's as if we've homogenized and pasteurized First Nations culture. Now, some just see it as a historical thing, and it has historical value, sure, but we don't go around seeing things that were historically uh, acceptable then. I tried to read the book Gone with the Wind and was, <clears throat> I couldn't read it because the N word was on just about every page. And the, the, the attitude towards the slaves, less than dogs. I don't know if it was just Margaret Mitchell or the movie was much sanitized, but even at that, a character like Mammy, Hattie McDaniel, brilliant actress, all she could play were these servant roles. She used to say, I'd rather, you know, uh, play a maid and be paid $200 <clears throat> than be a maid and be paid $2. But those were the limitations, as, as with Jay Silverheels, the beautiful Jay Silverheels. I got thinking about another Canadian figure. A controversial one in some ways. Paul, e. Pauline Johnson was a Victorian lady and she was of mixed heritage. Her father was Mohawk. Here we have the Mohawk connection again. Her mother was one of these highborn uh, Victorian ladies and they were quite well off. They really bucked the stereotype. Some people may have disapproved of this, uh, but they moved in polite society and they had several daughters and uh, I think it helped that they were wealthy and it helped that her father did work for and mingle a lot with white culture. It was just part of what he had to do, I think, to raise a family. Uh, again, choices weren't wide open. They just weren't. E. Pauline Johnson was a feisty girl with some literary talent. She was half Mohawk and was made aware of that at every turn. Um, so what was she going to do? Now, eventually, she became what was then known as a poetess, a woman who wrote poetry. Uh, and it was good for its time. It was sentimental, and poetry was. But then she got the idea of, what if I took my native heritage, my Mohawk heritage, and began to explore that in poetry, and, and began to explore it in performing that poetry? She made a career out of it, which was very interesting, because the first half of the concert recital would be, she would come out in this buckskin and this gorgeous, you know, native costume, which is kind of almost a Hollywood idea. Only there wasn't a Hollywood then, but the idea of this is how my audience will see 
Indians, an Indian princess. She would come out and recite poetry which related to that part of her heritage. Then in part two, and it was always part two, she would come out in Victorian dress, in a gown, probably with a corset, and recite that other side, you know, the non-native part of her, the non-Mohawk, the white part of her. So she was showing two facets of herself. She was a very, very um, independent woman. She never married. This was at a time when you had to marry, for heaven's sake. She traveled all over Canada on her own, touring, and was very well received as a poetess and had quite a reputation because what she was doing was unique. I kind of think that's interesting. It's not quite the same as, excuse me a minute, it, to me that's not quite the same as Twas in the Moon of Wintertime. It's a little different. I'm going to attempt to read my favorite poem by Pauline Johnson and try not to lick my fingers. It's quite long. But I'm going to read it. It's called Ogisto. I am Ogisto. I am she, the wife of him whose name breathes bravery and life and courage to the tribe that calls him chief. I am Ogisto, his white star, and he is land and lake and sky, a soul to me. Ah, but they hated him, those Huron braves, him who had flung their warriors into graves, him who had crushed them underneath his heel, whose arm was iron and whose heart was steel. To all save me, Ogisto, chosen wife of my great Mohawk, white star of his life. Ah, but they hated him and counseled long with subtle witchcraft how to work him wrong, how to avenge their dead and strike him where his pride was highest and his fame most fair. Their hearts grew weak as women at his name. They dared no warpath since my Mohawk came with ashen brow and flint and arrow head to pierce their craven bodies. But their dead must be avenged, avenged. They dared not walk in day and meet his deadly tomahawk. They dared not face his fearful scalping knife. So, nya! Then they thought of me, his wife. Oh, evil, evil face of them that sent with evil Huron's speech. Would I consent to take of wealth, be queen of all their tribe, have wampum ermine? Back I flung the bribe into their teeth and said, while I have life, Know this, Ogisto is the Mohawk's wife. Wah! How we struggled, but their arms were strong. They flung me on their pony's back with throng, round ankle, wrist, and shoulder, then up leapt. The one I hated most, his eye had swept over my misery, and sneering said, Thus, fair Ogisto, we avenge our dead. And we rode, we too rode, rode as a sea wind chased, I bound with buckskin to his hated waist. He, sneering, laughing, jeering, while he lashed the horse to foam as on and on we dashed, plunging through creek and river, bush and trail, on, on we galloped like a northern gale. At last his distant Huron fires aflame we saw, and nearer, nearer still we came. I bound behind him in the captive's place, scarcely could see the outline of his face. I smiled and laid my cheek against his back. Loose thou my hands, I said, this pace let's slack. Forget we now that I and thou are foes. I like thee well and wish to clasp thee close. I like the courage of thine eye and brow. I like thee better than my mohawk now. He cut the cords. We ceased our maddened haste. I wound my arms around his tawny waist. My hand crept up the buckskin of his belt. His knife hilt, my burning palm, I felt. One hand caressingly his cheek. The other drew the weapon softly. I love you, love you, I whispered. Love you as my life. And buried in his back, his scalping. 
Ha! How I rode! Rode as a sea wind chased, mad with sudden freedom, mad with haste. Back to my mohawk and my home, I lashed that horse to foam as on and on I dashed. Plunging through creek and river, bush and trail, on, on I galloped like a northern gale. And then my distant mohawk's fires of flame, I saw as nearer, nearer still I came. My hands all wet, stained with a life's red dye, but pure my soul, pure as those stars on high. My mohawk's pure white star, O Gisto, still am I. half bad poem. Um, it's got some guts in it. It's it's probably got some stereotypes in it as well because her audience needed something like that as a frame of reference. Um, I like it. I like it far better than the song my paddle sings and all those kind of things. I don't know this is just just some thoughts. I'm still not keen on the Huron Carol. I'm, I'm just not. It's colonialism, and nobody seems to be saying that. Um, now, there's an actor named Tom, Tom Jackson who sings this every year and earns money for charity, and that's good. Um, it all goes to homeless programs. It's called, the, the concerts are called the Here and Carol with an E on the end. I don't know why that is. But if you're making some good out of it, fine. But I do wonder why. We're not more discerning about these things, but I wonder why it has to be so so stale, so out of date, and still okay. That's what I think.